people tend to get really, really emotional about their brand and their name. Can you give a sense of like the range of what it costs to to submit, to file and be approved for a patent from beginning to end? So you're going to be making sure you have NDAs in place, that you're not going out and discussing these things publicly. You're going to be thinking about, okay, if I have employees or partners or as a founder, or do we have appropriate contracts that things that are being developed actually belong to the company and are assigned to the company? So you bring the cost, let's say, let's take an average of 50,000. You you can bring that down to how much by doing it fast tracked. So it's like they think that it's a great idea. They think it might save the world, but they get less emotionally invested. How do you balance that? The lean startup with protecting this thing that could have a very, a lot of value in the future. Someone put like a, an algorithm into ChatGPT to see if they could find a mistake. And it was oh, like- but an, it was a proprietary- a proprietary trade no secret way. algorithm. And so it was so, just- so, Okay, like, so what happens? What what happens there? Uh, Cybersecurity, data, yeah. AI, yeah. blockchain, if we have time. How are these technologies, these paradigm shifting technologies going to affect the field of intellectual property? <laughs> All right, Miriam Davidson, welcome on the Startup Talks podcast. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I think it was a long time coming. Yeah. Because you've got a lot of knowledge for our listeners on uh, the wonderful world of IP, intellectual yeah. property. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, I, I'm fairly certain we're going to have a very informative discussion today about how IP can be very strategic for startups and how uh, not taking care of it in the proper way or not addressing it can lead to massive blunders. Um, but uh, before we get into it, tell us a little bit more about Stratford and the company that you work for. So I work for Stratford Intellectual Property and we're part of the Stratford Group, which is a management consulting firm that helps companies scale and grow. And so we've got three different uh, business units, one of management consulting, one of sort of people and culture, and then us that does IP that does all things innovation, and helping your R&D be aligned with your business strategy. So, yeah. Yeah, right on. Um, and, and it's important to mention that Stratford IP and IIG, and since you know, Vesson gets to know, we're partners. Yeah. And so we obviously, uh, we've been working together for a few years now. We're going on a few years. And, you know, we've got some interesting projects in the works, which I think we'll touch on a little bit later. But um, obviously a natural mix of IP and incubation to help startups on both sides. Exactly. And I think that's really been a wonderful sort of collaboration over the last few years is really helping IIG startups navigate these challenges and identifying what are the things that they don't know that they don't know to help them make sure that they didn't make these mistakes or how can they kind of put their best foot forward at the different stages where they are in their development. Yeah. So it's been a great ride. It has. And I'll bite. <laughs> what is it that they typically don't know that they don't know? Like, let's just open it up. <laughs> There's so much. But the one that comes up over and over and over again with a lot of different companies, not just startups, is people tend to get really, really emotional about their brand and their name. Hmm. And emotional is not a bad thing. It's just we see more mistakes around things surrounding trademark strategy about patents because usually people don't fall in love with their patents. So, like they think that it's a great idea. They think it might save the world, but they get less emotionally invested. Like their name, their brand name, it goes to their core. It becomes very emotional. And so making sure you take those steps in the beginning to make sure that you pick a name that's defendable, that you can get, that you can register, that's enforceable, and so that you don't fall in love with something that you have to then change down the road or that you get a cease and desist. Yeah, and we've seen a lot of companies do this. A lot of founders who are very passionate, they come to us day one with like a name in mind. Yeah. And you, you mentioned earlier when we were talking uh, off, off uh, screen uh, that, you know, they'll put their product in market and they'll get things up and running and they'll notice that, oh, this this is already taken, right? Yeah, exactly. And by then, and it, it's complete human nature. It's You've sort of grown to love it so much that it's hard to then be objective and be like, no, I need to rebrand or no, I need to do this. And so really taking those moments in the beginning to making sure you're setting yourself up. Or if you have gotten to the point where, well, okay, now it's a sunk cost. Okay. Being, don't put your head in the sand about it, right? Like, yeah. okay, it is what it is. Let's just move on. It's too bad, but like it is what it is. got to deal with it. But I think that's the challenge with intellectual property, even for myself. And I've got quite a few years in this industry. It's not very clear when 
um, you should protect yourself on these different levels. We talk about trademarks, we talk about patents, we talk about, uh, you know, the names. Uh, when, you know, if we can maybe use IIG's programs as a proxy, right? We, yeah. we divide our programs in four phases. So ideation, validation, prototype, and growth. You know, where along that continuum do you typically, does a founder need to start taking action on uh, protecting their intellectual property? Yeah, so I think I'm going to start that by saying all companies, whether an IIG startup or just, you know, mom and pop shop down the road, everyone has IP. So myth number one is I have no IP. I'm not doing anything innovative. Everyone has IP, even if it's just the name of your store, the name of your company, the name of your brand, like how it looks or how you do things. Everyone has some version of IP. So mm. this is really relevant for everybody. And maybe before we dive into how the different sections, you know, how it applies to each, look, let's maybe just do Maybe a define? Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, like, let's run through what's what. <laughs> let's go through the jargon. Yeah, let's go through the jargon. Okay. So, uh, well, we mentioned trademarks, trademarks, right? Trademarks. That is all things relating to your brand. So the goods and services and how you name them. This is different than your trade name, which is the name that you register your company under. They can be similar, but they don't necessarily have to be. Um, so trademarks are goods and are marks or logos, names, words, colors, whatever you want that are associated with your brand. We have an example. Yeah. So think uh, Lululemon. Yes. L-U-L-U-L-E-M-O-N. That, the name, like the word, can be a mark. Yes. The way it's stylistically written can be a design brand, so a, like a, a logo brand. Yeah. Um, a color, uh, Louboutin shoes. Yes. The undersole red. Uh, you know that that is a trademarked. Is it a unique red? Because I know a that, unique red. Because I know my Mazda is in a red that only Mazda, I exactly. guess, has the rights to. So it's the same idea. It's as the, the same idea. It is like a distinguished. Everyone knows that red is Louboutin. Okay. Cool. Um, similarly. Uh, so you have word marks, you have logos, you have colors. Um, you can even have like a, an interesting interplay between designs, which we'll talk about next, and trademarks. If you have created a design that is unique, hmm. you can then actually trademark it. So think uh, things like Birkenstock shoes, I believe, have a trademark on the look of their design because designs have a limited time frame and trademarks, as long as you keep paying for them, you can keep renewing them into perpetuity. Okay. okay. So yes, trademarks is... What are you known for? What is your brand? How do people recognize you? Okay. Industrial designs or design patents are, how does it look? How do people, how, if someone sees your product on a shelf, or is there a graphic user interface in software that's particularly distinctive? That falls under uh, industrial, industrial design. design. Yeah. So you, UI, UX? Uh, like the, the, like, so for example, like the example that we hear a lot is like the little car driving down uh, like an Uber. That mm. was sort of a design. And so the other people couldn't use um, cars. They had to put like other things. No way. Yeah. Huh. Um, but yeah, so a, a more a sort of an easier example to think of is like the shape of the Tropicana orange juice bottle. Yeah. You know what it looks like oh, yeah. when you see it on the shelf. That is Tropicana's design. And it's, I'm guessing like just to maybe take a pause there. That's so important for a product differentiation, right? Like yeah. in the look and how it feels, right? The Tropicana bottle, if I remember correctly, it's got this like, yeah. you know, it's got this very uh, smooth, rounded shape. Um, it's memorable as yeah. opposed to like a carton, like a, yeah. like a, like a like square, a box. like a box. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, I remember that. And you've yeah. got a few products that we could probably think of that have that, you know, differentiator in how you use it. So that's industrial design. Yeah, that's industrial. So yeah, so the design is purely aesthetic. It's purely visual that has no functionality. Hmm. Functionality, then you're in the realm of utility patents. You know, what are you trying to accomplish? How are you solving a problem? You know, how are you making things more effective? That's in uh, utility patent world. Mm -hmm. Things Again, things as well, if you could reverse engineer what has been done, that's a utility patent. If you can't reverse engineer how it's been done, you might be in the realm of trade secrets. Think, think algorithms, um, things that you would have to hack into computer systems to find out. And I heard that Google, for example, their, their search algorithm that is very powerful and made them a monopoly in search is a trade secret. Correct. Yeah. Right? Because, yeah, they haven't published it. And then lastly, um, you have things like copyright, which are sort of inherent rights that you create when you create 
sort of any type of content. Uh, and then those, you know, are basically for artistic works, right? So if you think like right. written, written audio. Ar- audio, visual, things like that. Okay. It's funny, WIPO had a, a cute little LinkedIn post a couple weeks ago saying, uh, identify which of these four pictures have IP. And one of them was like, like a cat and another one was like a design and one of them was a patent and one was a, I don't know, like an industrial secret. And somebody was like, <laughs> not just I had to troll it, but wrote, they all have IP. Someone has a copyright on those four images. <laughs> 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 so you can't get away from it. You really can't. Okay. Um, so yeah, so those are like the major types. There's other things like uh, plant breeders rights and things like that or um, design oh, circuit board. Genetic mat- genetic information in the case of those uh, Monsanto seeds or whatever. So you can't, uh, you can't patent something that's available in nature, but you can patent variations that you've created or optimizations that you have created for certain industries. Wow. That's, that's getting scary because we now have the ability with uh, different processes to like manipulate genetic code, right? And well, branch it off. Yeah. So but then that's been happening for like the last, you know, well, I would say the 25 years, but it's probably, that'd be dating myself because it's been happening longer than... <laughs> I've been around. That's right. We're doing it. We're doing it more cheaply now. From yeah, what I understand, exactly. With CRISPR and such. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah. that that's a whole thing. Um, so yeah, so there are different types of IP, and I think it also an important thing to realize is that they layer. And so, if you think of a software company like a software as a service, you might have a brand in your company name. You might have a patent on what your software is doing. Mm-hmm. You probably have copyright in the code that you've created to actually have the software. You might have a trade secret on the algorithm. You might have a design on how it's being presented to the end user. So really thinking strategically about Oh, and there might be some data behind there, and then there's some mm. IP considerations around that. So, like, really thinking strategically about IP is not just a patent, but what is it that I do? How do I stay competitive? That's right. You know, why, you know, why would people come to me? And how do I make sure someone's not going to open up shop now down the road? That's right. And I think it's important to underline this point. You said strategically a couple times. What does strategically mean in the case of startups and business, right? One of my favorite books, I don't know if you had the chance to read it, but it's called The Seven Powers of Business Strategy. Oh, I haven't read it. That sounds great. Fantastic. It's on a, it's on our shelf on okay. the other side. I'll, I'll give it to you after. But one of the uh, powers yeah. is cornered resources. And this is just another name for, um, you know, things that you have, um, you know, unique access to that others don't. Yeah. And IP falls into that, like your your name, your brand, your 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 patents, for example. And owning something that'll give your company an advantage, but no one else can have access to it, is itself strategic because it yeah. protects your profits. You know, your potential for cash flows and profits into the future. Yeah. And in the case of IP, obviously, uh, sometimes these are like time, time delineated. That is to say, like you, you have access to a patent for like, you know, was it 20 years, 20 years, yeah, 20 years. Right. So, you know, during that time, you know, pharmaceutical companies are huge, um, I guess, users of patents because it'll protect them, um, in using a drug formula for 20 years, during which time they, they virtually have no competitors using that same, you know, maybe process or or output product. Exactly. And then, so that's basically, and I guess the there's that huge general public conception of oh, the patent system is rigged, it's wrong, it's evil, it's, you know, I think my personal view of it is it's essentially a pragmatic solution to the reality of uh, capitalistic research. But if you think about it uh, from a historical perspective, the patent system was developed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago when Mm -hmm. the only way for technology to move around and be disseminated was, you know, people were going around in boats. So if you had like a businessman in Italy and he went to the UK and he saw like a really cool plowing machine, he could bring back a plowing machine, get a patent in Italy, and then he- be protected in in, his jurisdiction. Be protected in Italy. And then, you know, okay, 20 years later, now all the Italian farmers- could have access to this plowing machine. So it sort of was a way to sort of help promote dissemination of information and, and innovation throughout the world. Now, with the advent of global technology and the internet, we now have this thing called global novelty as opposed to regional novelty. Because mm. So we can't play the whole little like, well, they only had it in the UK. They never had it in Italy. Like that doesn't work anymore. But 
at the end of the day, within your pharmaceutical example, pharmaceutical companies are spending so much money on R&D and it takes, it's really like a process of elimination. They ha have to go through so many targets before they can find one that works and they have to put it through trials. And if they didn't have that sort of payoff at the end, then oh, the research, the would, research be, would dry up. Yeah. That, and, and it would be untenable, yeah. right? I mean, it kind of secures their research knowing that they can They'll basically have like a monopoly on the drug that they can sell after. And actually, it's an amazing point about strategic use of IP, because if you think about it, different companies have used IP strategically for general adoption of their technology. If you think about it, like in the beginning, Tesla was saying, look, we're going to have patents because we know it's the name of the game. And if you cause us any problems, we'll then start asserting them. Mm -hmm. But we need the rest of the world to start putting in like chargers. So you may use any of our technology yeah. and we won't like don't cause us problems. We won't cause yeah. you problems. But help. And that's when they opened it up. And right? they opened it up. That's incredible. Same thing with for basically when um, at the beginning of COVID, when Moderna, Moderna has a, had, has a ton of patents. And mm -hmm. they basically said, look, we will give you, we will give the world like we are working in a global pandemic. We need to come together. We have access to this IP. They basically allowed their technology to then be used by anybody to create COVID vaccines. But they put that delineation around it and going like, look, it's going to, they knew having people accept mRNA vaccines was going to be a hurdle. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it was a thing that we could use, but by allowing everyone else to use it, now they have, people are more aware of it. They feel more comfortable with it. And now they have more <laughs> general acceptance because now they can, they have rights that they did not give to other people for other types of uses where they can develop these mRNA vaccines. So by allowing other people access to the IP, they were able to make that sort of, let's say, greater good, sure. but also dissemination and acceptance by the general public. So there's a, there's a lot of this interplay, and it's part of it's pragmatic. It's just the, the way the world works and the way we've best come to navigate it. But I don't know. I work in the field, so I tend to be like it tends to be better on the better side rather than you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you you bring up a great point, and excuse me in advance for this, but I I like to ask our guests sometimes to steel man. Yeah. The what's the case against patents? Like some people do have reservations. They say you know maybe it it promotes anti competitive behavior and this and that. Yeah. You just made great arguments against that, but yeah. what's the other side of the coin? And maybe we'll come back to why, you know, in general, they're a force for good. Yeah. So I think if you had to make an uh, argument against it, it's exactly what you said. They said that, you know, if people, um, there are some inventions that are better for everyone to have access to. And yeah, you're right. Okay, if you came up with a drug and everyone could then need the drug and then if it couldn't get pumped out fast enough, then yeah. That cures cancer, that for example. That cures cancer. I mean, cancer is a funny one because cancer is... <laughs> I have a biochemistry background, and so oh. it's, cancer is actually fascinating because cancer is a word that we use to describe so, so many, many things. Di different things. Yeah, which is why yeah. when people are like, there should be a cure for cancer, you're like, that is not a which thing. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> like, which very specific variation of ways that went wrong are you talking about? Um, right, 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 right. Good point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so I would say people might say that. Um, and I think, you know, I think it also comes down to like, you know, you have people who, when they have their patents, uh, then might stop, you know, uh, for example, pe allowing w how terms of use of, let's say, food or, um, you know, uh, yeah, I guess foods and plants probably are the ones that tend to have the most public backlash. Mm -hmm. um, and because then are the terms of, you know, are the terms of use fair or not? Um, so maybe you could say, like, my, my simple way of processing what you just said is, Anything that gets close to what we consider basic needs, yeah. people probably want to prevent them from being patented. Uh, or the patent system being abused. Let's patent put it that way. Patent system being abused. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, again, it, it is a, it's a balance, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's the best system we have found for the way the world works. But uh, yeah, there there's definitely conversations and there's definitely things of whether you're legally right or legally wrong and how that plays out in the court of public opinion. So, yeah, always public opinion. Yeah. But in general, you know, I really liked your example of the Italian merchant who yeah. finds an innovation elsewhere, brings it back to, let's say, Venice or whatever, yeah. um, and now has like 20 years to exploit that new way of doing X, Y, Z. And, you know, that allows you to build a business model around the innovation and maybe even iterate on it multiple times. So by the time the patent period is over, you know, you can transfer that knowledge to the rest of the, you know, city or country, state. Yeah. And, and in general, it'll permeate the population. 
um, you know, there's always that argument, the, the, the Telian argument of like competition is for losers, mm -hmm. right? I don't know if you heard that. No. Um, he argued, Peter Thiel argued that like, you know, in, 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 in economics textbooks, we talk about business competition as a good thing. Mm -hmm. He argues that it's a bad thing for profits and for progress because, um, you can't build the foundation of a strong business. It's kind of the same thing you said about the pharmaceutical companies that are investing a tremendous amount in research. And then if they, you know, started commercializing it, but everyone else could benefit from that previous research, then it would all be for naught. Yeah. Um, so where am I going with this is like, maybe it's a way for society to like, um, to allow us to take risks, like big risks on innovation and make sure that the people who come up with them, who put in the work, can capitalize it, capitalize on it for a certain amount of time. Yeah, it's that trade-off of what you give and what you get. Mm -hmm. You have taken the risk, you've put in the time, the effort, the money. We'll give you that, you know, twenty-year protection, and also they give you that eighteen-month publication lag, which allows you to keep continuing to work on and be a year and a half ahead by the time it becomes public knowledge. Mm -hmm. So you do have to give public knowledge of you know the best embodiment or how to actually make it work. But it's not like it's published the day after. You have 18 months to continue getting ahead. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. Uh, what else should we talk about? We I have was going to so say, I think we, we sort of set this all up to then talk about how does it actually link in the different areas. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, sort that's of right. why we started down this road. <laughs> okay, okay. No, but yeah. So if we can generalize, because yeah. obviously every case is unique, but you mentioned trademarks, patents, uh, trade secrets, you name it. Yeah. When do these typically like maybe in order of startup development? Yeah. So if we start off like you have an idea, let's think of, okay, if you start with an idea, if you want to think of it on a high level, let's think about what types of IP might eventually be important. Are we talking designs? Are we talking, there's going to be some sort of utility if there is a design, oh, just general best practice, don't talk about things until you've either filed it or have an NDA. And if you sell in the U.S., even under NDA, that still counts as public disclosure. So like general best practice, just don't talk about it until you've signed stuff um, or filed. But start thinking in that early phase, okay, when I'm trying to think of ideas and how I'm going to build my business, how will I eventually be able to protect this in order not to have copycats? Mm -hmm. Because if I develop an idea or a product that eventually I can't protect for whatever reason, mm -hmm. then I'm putting in all this work and I'm not going to get the payout because if it's a good idea, people will just copycat me. And then let's say you think of like, oh yeah, this might actually be like a tech idea or this might actually have a patent. I'm going to tell you, you know, get a general, go, go into Google, see what's out into the world. Um, go on to the European Patent Office has a patent database called Espasnet. You can search for different things and see what kind of patents are in there. I mean, Google Patents has something similar. If you're thinking for patentability, anything that has been published or is out in the world will can and will be used against you. Hmm. Uh, fun fact, not all patents are valid because the examiners only have a certain amount of time to examine them. Okay. And so uh, they do the best they can in the time that they have, and then they basically put it out into the world, and it becomes a third-party, um, essentially, debate on whether or not it's actually valid after the no fact. No way. Yeah. Yeah. So which is why, like, <laughs> if you find something and you're like, oh, God, this is terrible, first of all, don't write that down. Um, <laughs> is that what we call patent pending? No. So patent pending is after you file, before it goes through this examination. Oh, sorry. Life pro tip. If you're going to file a patent, it's going to cost you money. And it's not going to be like just the filing fees up front. Yeah. You're going to pay to draft it. Then you're going to pay to file it. And then eh, maybe a year, maybe 18 months, maybe two years later, you're, while you're still in patent pending, an examiner is going to pick it up and go, you said you wanted this much. And I'm not sure if, if this is going to be only audio, then like no one's going to see my huge hand. Oh, yeah, hand. no, no. They're going to yeah. see your, yeah, yeah. 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 So you're, you're going to say, I want this much. The examiner's going to say, no, I'm going to give you this. Okay. And then you're going to respond back, no, I disagree. You should give me that. And you're going to do this dance back and forth. Every Those are called office actions. They occur. Knowing that these occur and knowing that you're going to have- They cost. Cash, they cost money. Knowing yeah. that you have to do have those costs down the road is a good thing for people to know because uh, a, sort of a myth that we see with people not being aware of patents is they think that it's like that first initial like cost outlay and then they're done they can put like registered patent 
And so they don't necessarily budget for like the short and medium term costs that are going to come up down the road. Right. And, and speaking of costs, I'm, I try to keep this as practical as possible for startups. But can you give a sense of like the range of what it costs to to submit, to file and be approved for a patent from beginning to end? So different. OK, this all depend on how complex your technology is. Like a, a relatively simple mousetrap is going to be very different than a quantum computer yeah. <laughs> algorithm. Because the evaluate, the examination is going to require a bunch of experts, experts coming in. And, and, and yeah. you're going to need a very specialized expert to draft the, the, the application and prosecute it. Anyway, so general ballpark, you're probably looking anywhere in the eight to $15,000 to draft it and okay. submit it. You're probably looking at on average, three rounds of office actions. If you get through in one, you probably went too narrow. If you have a particularly business relevant and potentially contentious invention, you might go through seven or eight rounds of office actions. Okay. Each round of office actions usually are about six thousand dollars each. Okay. Then you, when you finally get to issuance, that's another two, three grand, and then you probably have maintenance fees, which are in the range of a couple hundred dollars a year to a couple of thousand. Okay. So on all in, you're probably looking at about well, somewhere from thirty-five to sixty thousand right. dollars per patent per country. Per country, per yes, country. that's important. Yes. So, do companies like Tesla or uh, Microsoft or whatever do they file patents in all countries, or do, are they even more? Even if they've got unlimited resources, do they say like, well, you know, some of these Asian countries are not relevant uh, to our market, so we're not going to? So, on average, when you look at the analytics. And this is not going to be relevant for startups because they're not going to have this kind of budget. Sure, sure. But um, – Oh, you never know. I mean, you never know. But like – Shopify uh, yeah, is yeah. from our city, so. Yeah, yeah. But the, the, I think they're at the point now they're not exactly <laughs> the budgeting startup <laughs> stage. No. Um, <laughs> so most, most patent – what we call patent families, when you think of like you have a U.S. member, a Canadian member, let's say a European member, a Chinese member, most will be filed between one and four countries. Okay. Um. Though, Does the EU count as a country? Uh, the EU counts as a country if you go through the European Patent Office, and then oh, you're going to have. That's good. That's yeah, like an all in one, right? Yeah, for the at least for the prosecution. At the end, once it's granted, you have to pick uh, where you want to go. Um, but now they've started the Unitary Patent Convention as of June first. So then now that it's turned the whole thing upside down as well, um, the UK. Uh, they're, they're uh, special considerations. If you're talking about uh, oh, yeah, of course. Europe, uh, if you're <laughs> right thinking exactly. of the European market <laughs> with your IP service provider and you think the UK is included in the EP, like in your EP application, just make sure to confirm with them because it is in some and not in others. Yes. So it depends what you're looking at. <laughs> Hashtag um, Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So most applications are either in one country if they're small two to four if they're slightly more medium sized or not as business critical. Yeah. When you're thinking of these sort of pharmaceutical ones, it's they will very easily go into 25, 35, yeah. 40 countries easily. So they're spending a couple million dollars at the outset, right? Yeah. But it's worth it because just their R and D costs are I heard up to a billion dollars to create a new drug or something. Yeah. yeah. So so it kind of is a no brainer for them. And and you know, like maybe um, we'll take the startup, the, the software startup perspective, which debatable if they need patents, but let's say they do and they're attacking the, the North American market first and foremost. And in there, they probably have like five years worth of work to, mm -hmm. to get, you know, disseminated. Then it makes sense to probably just stick to those two countries and at the limit, just like America, right? Yeah. The biggest market and be strategic, like put, put all your focus there. And then this is where sort of you can do things like use their different sort of patent prosecution uh, harmonization programs. And so, for example, you can file in the U.S. at the 12-month mark, and this is total 12 months, not like you can't do priority than U.S. than like a year later. It's like at the 12-month 12 12 after your priority date or your first filing date, you can then file either in the PCT, which is the Patent Cooperation Treaty, that buys you an extra 18 months to pick what other countries you want, or you could, let's say, file in Canada, but not request examination get prosecute your patent in the US, get an issuance, and then bring it to the Canadian office and say, hey, the US gave me this patent. Why don't you give me the same one under this patent prosecution highway? And generally, hmm. that tends to go... The, you fast track. Uh, you fast track it because you're essentially saying, look, someone else has done all the work. Um, it basically fits. 
So yeah. you bring the cost, let's say, let's take an average of 50,000. You, you can bring that down to how much by doing it fast tracked. So I remember I was saying it's like $6,000 for office actions. You yeah. can usually get from three office actions down to maybe one. So okay, you're, so like, there you go. And, yeah. and, and you yeah. have a cleaner prosecution history because you don't risk saying one thing in one country, another thing in the other. Oh. So it's cheaper, it's cleaner, it gives you more consistent claims. It, they're like slight variations because in the US you can do continuations while in Canada you can only do divisionals and they're slight technicality differences on like content mm -hmm. um so that you know your mileage may vary on how you want to use this but mm -hmm. yeah from a cost savings perspective also from a delaying cash flow perspective yep. because then you're not prosecuting both at the same time when you would need all that cash at mm -hmm. the beginning you can start with one delay yeah. cost for the other and it's kind of like um in business you you have scale economies it's another yeah. scale economy right exactly the more countries that you file in you can sort of save along the way, right? Well, and that's if you are aware that this program exists. Uh -huh. Not everyone knows that this program exists. The, the amount of times that we've sort of taken on clients when they were kind of middle of their IP journey and we said, oh, what have you? Have, why have you guys not done this thing? And they were like, oh, we didn't even know that was possible. What's the name again? The Patent Prosecution Highway. The Patent Prosecution, Prosecution Highway. Highway. Okay, so, so we're going to yeah. try to add some information under the video for this. This this sounds pretty useful. It's incredibly useful. And like I said, like well, like you said, it saves costs, but then it also has all these added benefits. There, It just, it's not going to work 100% of the time because it may not be what is best for the business, depending on what claims you've gotten in different countries and what's relevant okay. for okay, that. Okay, very cool. Yeah. So all that, talk your experts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why we have you guys around. Exactly. Let's go back to our famous uh, continuum of startups, yeah. right? Okay. So in the beginning, you're kind of thinking about, okay, what's going to be my idea? How would I be able to protect it? You might be doing some preliminary researching. Mm -hmm. Google. Google, and, Google Asposna, know, free, databases. free databases, things like that. Uh, the next one was... Validation. Validation. Okay. So now you're like figuring out, does this make sense? Yeah. Like it, for us, the validation phase is very much, you take these hypotheses of like, I think this could be a good business, but yep. first let's go talk to the market. Let's, 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 um, you know, prototype in a very lean way, some kind of solution. Let's, let's figure out a rudimentary business model. So you're basically testing your hypotheses and seeing how they stand up to reality before you commit too many resources. So at this point, you're going to actually be doing things that are less on the IP rights and more on the sort of IP sort of foundational stuff. So you're going to be making sure you have NDAs in place, that you're not going out and discussing these things publicly. You're going to be thinking about, okay, if I have employees or partners or as a founder, or do we have appropriate contracts that things that are being developed actually belong to the company and are assigned to the company? Are we making sure that, you know, we might be a startup and we might be lean and we're working in a joint space? Are we like blah, blah in the in the common room about all the things we're doing? Or are we putting stuff on whiteboards and leaving it there the whole time? So really that sort of cultural component and yeah. those con making sure that your contracts are in place so that as you are validating those ideas, you are sort of keeping them confined and protected and not making them public disclosures. So what's really challenging about this, and we sometimes tell our founders to like, yeah, like NDAs, don't worry about that. This is my bad <laughs> in the sense, but there is an argument to be made about, you know, that can slow down a process tremendously. It can add a lot of uh, formalities when yeah. you're just having a quick discovery conversation and you're testing a value proposition. Mm -hmm. How do you balance that, the lean startup with protecting this thing that could have a very a lot of value in the future? So there are a couple of points to this. So the first thing I want to kind of life pro tip, if you think that you may have talked about this, whenever you are, keep it keep track of that date, hmm. right? Because I mentioned uh, some countries will allow you to, will have a public disclosure grace period of one year. The US and Canada are examples of that. Europe, the minute you talk about it publicly, no longer allowed. But free Canada, game. Yeah, it's free game. Okay. Canada in the US, you have a one-year grace period. So tell your patent agent about the disclosure date so they know what they're working up against. But they also can talk to you about what is actually what was actually enabled. Because let's say I have a great idea for, let's say, a software. I can talk about it on a higher level and assuming, of course, that the higher level of a software has been generally disclosed in the public and we're not talking about something that's so radically new that it's going to, you know, rock the world. But it's something that's, you know, within the realm of things that already exist, you mm -hmm. might have just found a better way to do it. You could talk about to the patent agent down the road about, you know, how much 
actually counts as enabled disclosure. Because if I were to say like, oh yeah, I have a great new software to do, blah, in one sentence, like it's not like the other person can work back how I did it or so what I So that's what I mean. So when, when we test, when we talk about testing a value proposition, it's really seeing in the, uh, in their counterparty, usually the, the target market, what impact it would have on their lives, their business, their whatever. And so you're not really unveiling anything technological. You're, you're actually abstracting the technology and the solution away. And it's like, here's the impact it can have. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is when we're testing our value proposition in the market for startups who are in the validation phase, mm -hmm. that isn't necessarily something that you have to have signed NDAs for. I mean, if you can have them better. You know? Okay. Okay. So you heard it here. <laughs> maybe, maybe good to have NDAs. Yeah. You're like, it's always better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, this is just a sidebar, but it makes me think you, you should definitely have like this, you must already have this checklist, right? Yeah. And I think we've even given it to you guys yes. for you to give to your companies. And now what I'm thinking is we need to like fuse it with everything we're learning on how to yeah. validate quickly startups and find the nuances in them because we yeah. don't want it to be too rigid neither. No, right? it's got to be pragmatic, right? Because otherwise it's just, it's a report sitting in a desk or on a hard drive at this point because right. no one prints anymore. And, and most importantly, trying to kind of understand the risk yeah. that we're taking by, you know, favoring speed yeah. over due process. Yeah. And, and I think that's the the secret. And I think, yeah, and I think that's the very key point is that intentionality around it. It's because you can choose to make a business decision that I will tell this to the world because I think that's what I need to do to be able to get move it forward, get collaboration, whatever. You, but you should be making that decision intentionally. It shouldn't mm -hmm. just be like, blah, and then, oh, oops, uh, mm, mm, what yeah. am I going to do now? <laughs> I did a thing. Yeah. How do we damage control? Yeah, damage control, ask for forgiveness, <laughs> yeah. forgiveness after is a bit more costly when you talk yeah. about IP. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, um, that, so I think you did a great job uh, on ideation and validation. Yeah. Were, were you done on those? I think those are it. And then now if we move to prototype. prototype. So okay. when you start building, so for the audience, this is the phase where I validated my business hypotheses. You know, there is a need in the market for what I, I you know, what we could make. Now we start building yeah. uh, the famous MVP and we start structuring an organization around that. So uh, incorporating, we start getting our accounting and b banking set up and we, to be able to receive money from the market and this kind of stuff. So basic structuring and you're building product. Yeah. So now what? So now it goes back to my, your love of your name understand that your trade name is not necessarily your trademark, right? Yes. You, and so take the time to make sure that you do the appropriate research to make sure that your trademark, your brand name is something you can protect because- Which it, which founders can do on what site? Uh, so for example, CIPO has a site, the Canadian Intellectual Property Office has CIPO. a- CIPO. CIPO has a site. We'll link that below. Um, and then the USPTO has a site for that as well. And then the World Intellectual Property Office has a sort of a global brands database. We can put all those links there. Um, I just want to let people know it's not foolproof because if effectively you can find direct hits you will be judged against what we call fuzzy hits. So like homonyms, things that sound the same, things that are spelt a little differently. Oh. So just because you get cleared on one thing, on one name, doesn't mean you're 100% in the clear. Talk to an what expert. Was, there is this joke. I remember Microsoft, Mike Rowe Soft. Yeah. Uh, you know the Dirty Jobs guy? His name is Mike Rowe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, yeah. And I think someone created a company called Mike Rowe Soft. <laughs> And Microsoft came after them because it sounds exactly the same. Yeah. And they're like, no, 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 you're, this is not going to pass. But I was like, <laughs> yeah. that's genius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like that one, just like how it sounds, but also it's just like, oh, like if there's one, like if it's just like, I'm trying to think of ones that I can say, um, if it's just one letter was taken out and it's kind of close or it or it's variations on a name that are very similar and that it's so hard cuz so all the hard. good names are taken then this is what but this is why like pharmaceuticals are named things like Xanax cuz it's also <laughs> like <laughs> they put the, it into like a random name the, generator the at that like, point boo. okay don't hey, you, <laughs> yeah, don't do that <laughs> Don't do that. Just come up with random stuff yourself. Really? You uh, yeah. can't? Uh, oh, because I, then does it like, belong? Yeah. Who does it own? To, like there's whole debates on who, uh, who does is... generative AI, who, who owns the rights of that. And it's ever changing. By the way, we're going to have a, like a discussion about 
AI and yeah. IP, but for now, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll just, finish the... Yeah, please <laughs> don't ask ChatGPT what to name your company, okay? Like... <laughs> <laughs> Sam Altman's going to knock on your door. It's like, so we own all of your stuff. Uh, hand it over. We're the profits. Here. Yeah, exactly. Like, send us the money. Um, but uh, yeah, so like it can't also be descriptive, right? You can't have like a, gul- a golf store called, you know, Pro Golf or whatever it is, because then that that's too descriptive and then other people couldn't uh, uh, do that. And it's actually even things like Pilates, which was in the end, like uh, originally a made up word, became so renowned no that it now it became part like, of the language, became part of the language that like, uh, yeah, you can't uh, trademark like something Pilates. So that's nuts. Yeah. So all this <laughs> to say, all this to say intentionality around your name, because I realize you're going to fall in love with it. I realize you're going to ha- be hugely emotionally invested in it in a way that is not th- the same with the rest of your IP. I get it. Help me help you. Come to me early. I was going to say, you should totally do a workshop on like coming up with a good name. And like, you know, like we bring a bunch of founders together that yeah. are more so in validation and validation and yeah. like, or maybe prototype, I guess in this case, and they yeah. start to like think of their name and then we yeah. do the proper process to see like what's out there and like what's a good name versus a bad name. Yeah, exactly. Know. And like how to like do that in a way that's just like, you're not going to, you'll have less chances of trouble down the road. So mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, you're in that phase, you're develop. think about your IP, think about how you're layering them, do the things you need to do in the beginning. As you're growing, you're also going to be thinking about your policies and your onboarding and your offboarding and your training and your culture and making sure your contracts, you have supplier indemnifications and things like that. And that sort of will bring you into your growth area. And these are all things that need to be done constantly and dynamically shift because at the end of the day, you're not doing your IP strategy because you want to have an IP strategy. You're doing an IP strategy because you want to have, you want to support your business strategy. Yeah. And so making sure that's aligned and making sure it pivots with your business strategy is critical and key. Which is why what we're talking about right now and the work that you do with Stratford IP is so important because it seems to the outside world, I'm, I imagine it seems like this really obscure domain and it's very complicated and there's a lot of jargon. There's a reason people call me. <laughs> exactly. And so to demystify that yeah. is going to be incredible. And I think, you know, maybe allow me to maybe shift towards the Elevate program. Yeah, I was just going to say this is a great way. And it's not just the Elevate program. Like I, mean, I would say let's f- frame it in the sort of IP awareness and IP literacy. Mm-hmm. And the Elevate program, the Elevate IP, which is a federal program that is being now disseminated and distributed by different uh, entities across the country. So you've got uh, one in Atlanta, Canada. You've got uh, Maine in Quebec, which is a Mouvement d'Accélérateur. Mouvement des Accélérateurs d'Innovation. N is like national, I guess. Yeah, so I it's think like so. of Quebec. Of Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> but with an N. <laughs> with an N. I hope I got that right. <laughs> we just say Maine. We, we, yeah, we, yeah, we just say Maine. Maine. <laughs> yeah, all the time. They're the best. Um, and then uh, in Ontario, Invest Ottawa and Communitech are going to be taking care of it. And then out uh, west, uh, there are going to be people in Alberta and then people in BC that are going to be taking care of it. But you have those. Uh, Basically, entities will be taking care of Elevate IP, but then you also have IRAP. So if you're an IRAP-funded company, they have a program called IRAP IP Assist, which has an L1, an L2, an L3. And so the level one is basically an IP awareness okay. uh, training session and sort of an ask me anything. And so if you're an IRAP-funded company, so as you're sort of getting further along in your development, if you're an IRAP company, you can ask your ITA, your industrial technology advisor, can I get, uh, can I get some... IP assist money, and then you can come to a service provider. And Next. they'll subsidize some of the costs that we they'll mentioned They'll subsidize earlier. some of the costs there, and then okay. you can get an IP awareness. And then uh, the different Elevate IP programs that are being happening across uh, the country are also working on IP awareness and IP literacy, because there's a lot of stuff on uh, the internet about IP 101 of like, what is a patent? And there's a lot of stuff on how to become a patent lawyer. There's not a lot of stuff on how to be an IP, like IP for executives and what do you need to know? Mm. And so uh, Stratford has the IP Strategy Academy. There's a, a free part of that as well that has sort of eight or 12, I don't remember. Certain number of foundational videos that you can see for free hmm. at ipstrategyacademy.com. We can put more information on that. Um, and then that'll sort of help give you a sort of initial idea of like, what is it that you don't know that you don't know? Right. Which is the biggest challenge. Yeah. And uh, is there anything else we can say about Elevate IP and your involvement in it? So um, the different programs are going to be running them slightly differently. So knowing which ecosystem you're in is going to be hugely important. 
um, reaching out. I think the different programs are going to start taking lists soon. There's going to be an education component. There's going to be a funding component. Mm -hmm. um, there are... I want to kind of talk about different sort of sources of funding for IP because there's actually a yeah. few that, different ways because there are things you can do for free and there are things that are going to cost you money and different programs will give you different types of money. So knowing that money is really important. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, so it's still very early stages because uh, the government promised the money, but I think it was at the end of last year. And then it was the mad dash for everyone to put in proposals of how they were going to look at it. And it's now just been awarded. And so now people are trying to figure out, okay, now we have the money. How are we actually going to make this happen? And there is variability on how each uh, different ecosystem is doing it. So talk to someone like uh, us and then we will, you know, funnel you to where you need to be. So uh, and help you sort of navigate it. Um, but then to go to the areas of money, there's tons of money that uh, startups can get access to because IP is can be expensive. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's. I want to just talk about things you can do for free. Sure. General, get yourself up and running on some sort of IP awareness, whether it's stuff you can read on the internet. Um, IP Ontario has also set up some training material. Like I said, Str uh, Stratford has some material. There's stuff on the internet like learn a bit more be aware that there's gonna be ip scams mm -hmm. people are going there it is a very common i don't want to say business practice because it's not a business practice it's a scam yeah people try yeah. to like get you to pay for things um and it's just and they're pure, not it's 100 fraudulent oh geez it's 100 percent fraudulent. And that sucks because they're targeting like vulnerable founders who are just looking to build their businesses and exactly you know. And it's too bad. Yeah. And so like they'll send out things that look like it's the patent offices. They'll send out things that make it look like they're law firms. They'll make it sound like they're marketing firms. And like if you don't pay me this, someone's going to take your brand or your whatever. And they create that sense of urgency. Um, so just getting that awareness and uh, getting about a, a bit of IP literacy and making sure that you do these sort of things that are like in that checklist that we talked about around getting yourself well set up in the beginning. Then you're going to have things that are going to cost money. Uh, then, so you think of IRAP mm -hmm. has money for uh, IP assist. How much, like, how how much will it um, reduce the costs of you know various IP filings? So then, IRAP will pay for education, strategy review, and strategic analysis. So tens of thousands of yeah, dollars. Yeah, tens of thousands of dollars, and it's Fantastic. subsidized at seventy five percent. Okay, there, that's the number. Yeah, seventy five percent. That's great. Um, but. Uh, it, it does not cover drafting and prosecution, which is... Which is that first part? Which uh, is the actually drafting your patent or drafting your trademark and then filing it at the which patent was office. Which 8 to 15,000? up front, yeah. Okay. And trademarks are in the lower and they tend to be like okay. 3 to... Three-ish to but start. St still a huge help, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. No, no, but... All the, out of the pocket. No, no, those... IRAP doesn't give you money for those. No, the IRAP gives you the other things for this strategy analysis. Yeah, I, I put it all together in the sense that in the sense that, like, if you're gonna, if you're gonna have, have to a pay choice for it. between fifty thousand and maybe like twenty five thousand, that's yeah. that's a huge difference. Um, yeah, and then there's other programs like so. For example, if you're a, a company in Ontario that are is in within certain industries, IP Ontario has a uh, thirty five thousand dollar, I believe, uh, voucher that mm. I think they're also seventy five percent. But the key point of theirs is you can use it, it on drafting and prosecution. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Innovation Asset Collective has a program where there's a certain membership fee, but then you get vouchers back for IP provider services, uh, Elevate IP. They're going to be giving, um, I think it's up to close to about $100,000 to each company wow. to manage their IP. But then again, the percentages are going to vary yep. on how much you need to pay in. So I think it's important, to mention, that, it's important to mention all of these programs, we will list them below. Yeah. And uh, that way, if you're a founder in any of these stages where it's relevant, then you'll yeah, be able exactly. to get more information. Exactly. And then it's also not even just, just general like IP money. But then if you think about it as well, like within the research and development, you, you link your research and development in your shred claims, um, you, making sure those are covered. And then like the government through IRAP will give you money for your shred claims. And so then how do you navigate that? And so kind of just having that intentionality and that awareness that there's money available and it's one of our competitive advantages in Canada is that the government supports R&D because we yeah. want to be a sort of a knowledge base and they're really trying to level up our IP commercialization capabilities. Mm -hmm. So there's money around. We just have to kind of help people find it, get it, and uh, it, it's really helpful. And gain expertise from from 
people like you, yeah. companies like yours. Um, so that's great. Now I would like to shift to one of my favorite things to talk about, which is the future and okay. the implications of new technologies on various domains. Today yeah. we're talking about IP. So, you know, I have four in mind that we had discussed prior to this. Um, they're all things that are shifting incredibly right now. Yeah. Um, cybersecurity, data, yeah. AI, yeah. blockchain, if we have time. How are these technologies, these paradigm shifting technologies going to affect the field of intellectual property or into like, yeah, like what, what effect is this going to have both on startups at a granular level and society at a more macro level? So if you think about cybersecurity, the way, the way that's the most common to think or the most common, like the best advice I can give you is think about it in two ways. You want to be thinking about cybersecurity as a way of you have these precious assets and you don't want people to be attacking, hacking you and getting into it and getting access to it. Mm -hmm. And so the amount of attacks and pings on people's companies is huge. Mm -hmm. Like our IT directors is like, oh, we've had X amount in the last month. And this is clear of everybody across the board. Your IT director at Stratford? Yeah, exactly. Like, really? Yeah, like all companies are getting cyber attacks. They're getting pinged. They're trying to figure out who and how can you get in. Mm. And so, number one, have a cybersecurity like plan, right? Like mm -hmm. you you have to be thinking about it. You can't just be like, oh, I'm cr you're creating something of value, right? Like you, you're you not going to just you go need to protect it. You need to protect it. It's kind of be like, aware. you know, the analogy is like if I use something very analog, if you have something valuable on your physical property, yeah. then you want to have a fence around the property. Exactly. And that's, that's the equivalent of your cybersecurity, but around your company. Exactly. Online. So you're thinking about ways of structuring it of, okay, first, be aware that this, you know, cybersecurity is a thing. So you want to be having... You want to be thinking about it. Yeah. And then it could be, you know, for example, how are you structuring your files, right? Like, are you separating things out that if one area gets uh, infiltrated, yeah. that it's separated and siloed? How are you dealing with rights management, things like that? So, like, things that you ne wouldn't necessarily think are part of your IP strategy, but mm -hmm. instead would be part of your IT strategy, mm -hmm. there are linkages. Whether we want or not, they're all transversal in the sense that they all cross over each other. They do. And yeah. we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll give exa other examples of that when we get to data. Um, mm -hmm. But like at the end of the day, all these separate sub-strategies are funneling into your business strategy. So like, okay, so you think about it from that sort of operational perspective, but also think about it from a sort of cultural perspective, right? Because a point of failure is people accidentally clicking on stuff, hmm. right? So make sure that you have cybersecurity human training, error. human error, yeah. right? Um, malware, like whatever. Redundant systems, right? Yeah, Where exactly. One person can't be the like single point of failure for an entire company's, you know, IP uh, exactly. You know, hack. Exactly. So like, basically having intentionality about that. Because especially if you're thinking of your trade secrets, you're probably going to be keeping them on some sort of server somewhere. You don't want someone hacking into that and. Um, giving it or and I mean that's not related to cybersecurity, but I'll get us to back to chat GPT. I just want to slip something in here, you know, um, and I was thinking about this when you were explaining it earlier, but if you have a patent, mm -hmm. so no, sorry. Even if there even if you get infiltrated and you know it gets stolen by China, let's say, I know yeah. there have been problems with IP in the past. Well, we can't really prosecute, right, in those jurisdictions. So like what do you do about that? Uh, if it gets stolen or yeah. if, if IP leaks and boom, now there's a Chinese competitor to Tesla uh, that's doing exactly the same thing. What do they do about that? So on a pragmatic level, it depends on how much you want to fight and how much money you want to do, throw at it and who do you know and how do you know? You need to be a billionaire yeah. slash, yeah. you know. Yeah. Or there, I mean, there are people who take this up on contingency based on what it is you're trying to do, but the art, what the what the spiel I give my clients when they say, "Well, do you want?" When we talk about whether or not they want to file in countries where there may not be as I don't want to say developed because it's not that they're not developed, the different uh, levels of IP uh, enforcement um, is that at the end of the day, it depends on who your competitor is and who mm. you are. If what the business case is, if you're basically trying to sell to large multinationals that tend to be publicly traded, they all have codes of conduct that say we respect valid IP oh, and that the valid IP is remember I was saying this more earlier yeah. like not all IP is valid so yeah. like their clauses usually say we respect valid IP so if those are your competitors the point of having a patent in China is not to stop the Chinese copycat is to give your but to give yourself 
clout and credibility against mm. a large multinational that does play by those rules. Interesting. And so they it, and they do play by those rules. Yeah, they the do. Multinationals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because they they would it could happen to them as well. It would happen to them as well, and oh. also because they are all they all have IP, they all have rights, and so they all navigate. And again, it's the what is valid is the patent valid? And so the amount of That's time- That's what the debate is. The debate is, you know, and whether it's valid or not. Um, but yeah, that okay. that's why you would go forward. Okay, but, thanks. To, but then to just loop back as well, like, yes, you could be, you know, get hacked, but also make sure you train your people not to put confidential trade secret stuff into chat GPT. It's, it now has a little <laughs> prop that tells you, like, don't do it. But then oh, yeah? I think when it started, like, I, what was it? Was it someone at, it was one of- one of the like uh, display manufacturers, someone put like a, an algorithm into ChatGPT to see if they could find a mistake. And it was oh, like- but an, it was a proprietary- a proprietary trade no secret way. algorithm. And so it was so, just- so, Okay, like, so what happens? What what happens there? Uh, does, it, does it get, is it owned by OpenAI whose own uh, data was pulled from v disparate data sources on the internet? It's just now it's like, okay, well now you're technically your algorithm is out into the world and someone else has it. And then I guess someone you could look at it and now like, it all depends on who owns this See, and what and Chat how. ChatGPT, I tested this. ChatGPT says that it doesn't share the information that you give it. I mean, at the end, what ha what happens if the let's say in this particular case, I think it was a display manufacturer. What if a display man and like another display manufacturer buys ChatGPT and will now have access to all of ChatGPT's data? Oh, and, oh look, now you. <laughs> This is so crazy. Um, that's a whole discussion on its own, the the AI yeah. thing. And I don't think we have time for like all of that. But what do you do about AI, right? You have to balance that pragmatic of like people are going to use it because it makes their lives easier. But like train them not to put confidential stuff in mm. there. Train it not – like if you're going to be doing any sort of gen generative thing, like again, go think back of what's business critical for us. Like if we're going to having be – trying to copyright stuff, or we're going to be trying to be creating things that are super business relevant. Like, let's make sure that we own what we think we own. And let's, let's actually create the things that are important to us. And again, this is mitigating risk, you know, balance resource versus risk. What's actually important to us, let's make sure we create that so that it's like our ownership of that is, you know, airtight. Yeah. Because this is a completely new area and the laws are going to change over time. And so you want to make sure that what you own is what you own, like, and not like what down and, the road, it'd be like, oh, that actually owned, is owned by someone else. Like, yeah, and 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 just to be clear, because I'm not super clear on this, when I interface with ChatGPT to create something new, whether it's like uh, uh, I generate names, yeah. for example, for a business, and you said earlier not to do that, or you you create a new algorithm, who owns that IP? I'm paying ChatGPT, so I'm paying for the premium version. So when I created a ChatGPT account I was I tried to get like a terms and services that I could actually read through to see what I was signing off on and of it did not give me one interesting which was really weird so it's trying to keep it as flexible as possible yeah so that they probably but I would really love to see who owns what because I mean there was yeah. a whole kerfuffle last week about zoom wasn't there about like no. now, okay I think there was this whole thing last week about zoom about like data that is created or you know like generative data and all the stuff that's happening in zoom meetings and who owns what and there was like this whole thing that they changed their terms of service and people started freaking out about stuff and other people were like no there's no need to freak out and other people were like we're freaking out and it but it's going to be a serious question in the following years, just based on the fact that, you know, I think it's estimated that the majority of creative endeavors, that is to say creative, whether it's writing or visual and um, intellectual activity is going to be undertaken by artificial intelligence yeah. relative to the human race. But I think this is where it's key to understand and to be clear around, like, so for example, I have softwares that will create visualizations and data based on da input data that's in it. Mm -hmm. You know, I search for stuff. It gives me pictures that look like an analytics. There are very clear terms and services about the confidentiality of data that gets put into this proprietary mm. database the com and the who owns the data. And because I've put it in and I'm using this paid service that they do not make, like they do not have any rights to this data. And that because I am paying for this service, I have the rights to use the images that it creates based on the data I've put in. Mm -hmm. And that is a very different ballpark than a you are the product yep. when you are go using a free service or a, and I mean, I don't have the premium, whatever, the paid chat GPT version, but like the free one off the internet. Usually Super fast, by the way. <laughs> That's why I pay for it because yeah. it writes like. 
incredibly quickly. Yeah. So then it's, it's yeah, it's understanding the terms and services of what it is you're trying to do. And as well, because I mean, we have to be pragmatic. People are going to people. Like People are going to people. Pe- people That's are going to people. That's the thing you've said so far. <laughs> people are going to people. You heard it here first. <laughs> so like it's, it's making sure that, pe- and we shouldn't be afraid of this, right? Like this is, it should be, how can we leverage these systems to make our lives easier so that we can automate the boring grindy stuff and Total, focus totally. on the fun value added strategic things right that's right but there is work around defining ownership of ip when using these you know mind enhancing you know yeah. tools yeah and and so i just want to recap here because we're not quite done we talked about cybersecurity and the yeah. importance of protecting our ip in a more and more you know digital world yeah. right where it, it is a free-for-all um we've talked about we went to ai after that yeah we talked about how you know, it's 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 forcing us to ask questions about who owns the IP. If we use a tool, um, you know, like ChatGPT, and we create something new, is it is it theirs? And they they probably need more transparency in terms of their terms of service. Yeah. Now there's another one that I think you're excited to talk about, which is data. All things data. Right. All things data. So. Yeah. Wax poetic. I want. I want to just listen. Oh to my you. God. Okay, I'm going to go through my whole say. spiel. Okay, yeah. so let's start back up at the top of why this actually matters. So we have our business strategy, and we're trying to achieve business goals. And we've got our, like our IT strategy over here, and we have our IP strategy over here, and we've got our data strategy, right? Mm-hmm. And more companies have more data than they know what to do with, right? And you've got like super business critical data, and you've got just like whatever a bunch of emails that yeah. may or may not be important. And then let's say you're a um, you're doing any kind of research or R&D or you have a sensor, like the future internet of things where, you know, everything's talking to each other. There's a massive amount of data and then there's just considerations. Data is not usually thought of when you think of like licensing and data and ownership, but on a high level, like you're thinking facts, data can be protected in different ways. Mm -hmm. A data set can be a trade secret because you have it and because you have it, and then nobody else does, it sort of gives you a competitive advantage. You can, how you manipulate it and search through it and sort of have that algorithm of modeling or forecasting or whatever, that could be a trade secret on that data. Mm -hmm. You can get patents on how you actually search through your data. You can get copyrights. Even though you can't get copyright on the data itself if it's a fact, the database structures Mm. and how you structure things, you can get copyrights on that. And I think the really key impactful ones, especially as we talk about large data sets and people collaborate, or first of all, people who owns what data, right? And so when you have a B2C business, that's very different than when you have a B2B business. Mm-hmm. Um, you have privacy regulations and that changes per country that you're sort of dealing with or in even industry that you're dealing with. So are you being compliant with that? And then if you're going to be having multiple people working on different on the same data sets, who owns what? Who's allowed to do what with it? Mm-hmm. Um, are they? Are they? If it gets derived and transformed, can they then sell? Can they then license it to your competitor? Because now your competitor has like a imp- new and improved data set that you've spent time creating. So really being intentional in those negotiations about what are we doing, and the answer again might be okay. The business case, even though this isn't ideal, it's we. We want to move forward. It's the only way to go. But then at least you know what you're walking into. And you're walking in with eyes open, right? As opposed to, again, oh, I just didn't think of it. And now, great, my competitor has my transformed and approved data. And we need to go do something else. There's a lot for a modern CEO to consider and when that's getting why, into business. Yeah, and that's why I think you can't do it alone. You need to have a good team. You need to have people who've been there before. You need people like IIG to help you sort of walk through the different phases. You need people like Stratford to help you It's your advisors, right? You want yeah. to surround yourself with the best in every field and kind of create your brain trust. Yeah, exactly. Right? So you can navigate this complex world because yeah. even I have trouble. Um, I certainly don't. I'm not on top of everything that I need to. And I think most founders can say the same. Um so, so just while we're still in the subject of data, mm-hmm. is there a specific resource that you would point them to? Is there a methodology that you guys are building to like, you know, take stock of their data, to organize it a certain way, to protect it? So there isn't actually a tool yet that I've found that I really love. And it's kind of on my list of things. Like how can we uh, create something that would be really helpful for people? But I so saw at the There's moment, a product opportunity there. Yeah. Same on the cyber side and, you know, obviously the AI, yeah. maybe there's but something. 
So but basically my biggest sort of life pro tip or takeaway at this point is just think about it. Put it on your radar. Put it on your agenda. Like think about how does this actually interplay. And you're probably doing most of it anyways because mm-hmm. if you're building a general data strategy, you are identifying what's important to your business. You're identifying what's business critical. You're identifying how it fits in in your R&D pipeline. So it's just adding in that extra layer while you're doing that work anyways right? To make sure that you've made that linkage and that cross network of, uh, things. This was awesome. (laughs) I think this is really valuable for founders who are listening and people in general who wanted to learn more about IP. Thank you so much. No problem. Miriam, this has been great. Is there any, is there anything else that you wanted to add before we wrap up? I was going to say y'all are awesome and the people should really come hang out with you guys. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you. Thank you. We try to have a, you know, a down to earth and, you know, we, we, we're all founders. Um, just to remind people, everyone on the IAG team and most of the board are startup founders or business owners of some sort. So I think it's important. And I think as well, it's amazing because then it also creates amazing that like the impact, like in say in one way, the economic impact, but then the community impact that you have within the region and sort of globally, eventually and things like that, you're making the world a better place and you're helping founders be more successful because I mean, the stats show it when founders are brought along when they have mentors when they have access to those kind of resources it's hard being a founder and being an entrepreneur right like it's almost impossible to do it alone exactly and so being surrounded by great people like you guys really helps people succeed and so thank you for that i really appreciate it i think you know it's all about building the super network yeah right of founders experts coaches service providers like yourselves investors um government agencies you name it just the biggest possible network and then the secret i think is going to be finding the right resource at the right time. Yeah. Talking about data earlier, it's easy to get lost in the sea of information and you know the daily schedule of a founder is already busy. And so I think what we really have to do is point them in the right direction at the right time. And maybe don't let perfect get in the way of good enough for now because you might have this really lofty idea that is not implementable at this point, but if you can just take the first step, you'll, you'll get there. Just that one is one step after the other. That is the perfect place to end. Yeah. You know, don't let perfect get in the way of good enough. Good enough. Thanks a lot, Miriam. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye.